Welcome aboard. Welcome to today's tour. We are currently at Miami Executive Airport in Miami, Florida. We are flying south from here today to talk about the Florida Keys, Key West, and Highway 1, better known as the Overseas Highway. That's the 113-mile stretch that traverses the Florida Keys and ends in that independent country, the Conch Republic. Okay, well, maybe they're still part of the United States after their proclaimed secession, but they tried. We will talk more about that and the route to get there from here in Miami once we are on our way. Let's get the plane started, the cockpit set up, so we can head south. Let's enjoy some beautiful scenery, and we will attempt to land in the Conch Republic also known as Key West, Florida. Another small airport today, Miami Executive Airport. It has the airport code KTMB and is located 13 miles southwest of downtown Miami. It has three asphalt runways and it sits on 1,380 acres. If this is your first time, welcome. What I do is I find interesting places to fly over and talk about and we visit them here in the flight simulator. Today we are back in the Cessna Grand Caravan, the 208B. We are at the hold short line, ready for takeoff. Buckle your seat belts, we will be in the air shortly. We are airborne and on our way to Key West, Florida. The Florida Keys are located off the southern coast of Florida. They are actually on the southeastern coast of the Florida Peninsula. And they start about 15 miles south of Miami and extend in an arc southwest all the way to Key West. There are over 800 keys in total, stretching over 180 miles, and there are 42 bridges connecting the keys or islands. The longest bridge, measuring 35,716 feet long, is the Seven Mile Bridge, and the Harris Gap Bridge is the shortest, and it's just 37 feet long. The keys are loosely grouped into the upper keys, the middle keys, and the lower keys. Key West, obviously, is located in the lower keys. There's also a fourth group known as the Outer Keys, and these would be the islands that you can only access by boat. The island of Key West, our final destination today, is about four miles long and one mile wide, with a total land area of 4.2 square miles. And it lies at the southernmost end of US Route 1, which is the longest north-south road in the United States. Key West is 130 miles southwest of Miami, and it's only about 95 miles north of Cuba. 
Key West is the southernmost city in the continental United States. For many years, Key West was the largest town in Florida, and it grew prosperous on wrecking, or the salvaging from shipwrecks. The Keys were originally inhabited by the Calusa and the Tequesta tribes, and they were originally discovered by Juan Ponce de Leon in 1513. We are now passing over the bridge that connects the mainland to Key Largo, the beginning of the Florida Keys. In 1815, the Spanish governor in Havana deeded the island of Key West to Juan Pablo Salas, an officer in the Royal Spanish Navy in St. Augustine. After Florida was transferred to the United States, Salas sold Key West to an American businessman, John W. Simonton, for $2,000 in 1821. Simonton went on to lobby the U.S. government to establish a naval base on Key West, both to take advantage of its strategic location and to bring law and order to the area. On March 25, 1822, Lieutenant Matthew C. Perry sailed the USS Shark to Key West and planted the U.S. flag, claiming the Florida Keys as the United States territory. For most of the 19th century, the major industries in Key West were wrecking, which was the salvaging of ships, fishing, turtling, and salt manufacturing. It was once also the largest producer of cigars. Well, until a fire spread through the town while the island's only fire truck was 1,500 miles away undergoing repairs, we are now passing over Key Lago. Cigar making, as well as other of the Key's traditions, were brought over by Cubans fleeing the revolution known as the Ten Years' War. Cigar making in Key West dates back to 1831 when William H. Wall opened a small factory on Front Street that employed about 50 workers to roll cigars and then other small factories opened up around the island at the same time, manufacturing cigars made from Cuban tobacco. And William Hall had only ended up in the Keys because he was shipwrecked and he decided to stay there. By 1889, Key West was the largest and wealthiest city in Florida. Key West has also been an important military location. The U.S. Navy's presence in Key West dates back to 1823, when the naval base was established to stop piracy in the area. So how did the route and access to the Florida Keys come about? Well, following the Civil War, the Industrial Revolution took hold of Key West, starting with Henry Flagler's Overseas Railroad in 1912, connecting Key West to the mainland Florida. Henry Morrison Flagler was an American industrialist and the founder of Standard Oil Company. He was also a key figure in the development of the Atlantic coast of Florida and the founder of the Florida East Coast Railway. Flagler took an interest in Florida while he was seeking a warmer climate for his ailing wife in the late 1870s. Returning to Florida in 1881, he became a developer of resort hotels and railroads along the east coast of Florida. Beginning in St. Augustine, he moved south. Flagler helped develop Ormond Beach, Daytona Beach, and Palm Beach. He also became known as the father of Miami, Florida. Flagler's rail network became known as the Florida East Coast Railway, or the FEC. By 1904, the FEC had reached Homestead, south of Miami. We see here, we're coming up on a Tavernero Park airfield, which means we're on Plantation Key. One interesting thing located here off of Plantation Key is known as Toilet Seat Cut. It's a small channel, a man-made cut, but what was interesting is that after Hurricane Donna in 1960s, along one of the posts on this channel, there was a toilet seat found hanging from it. Of course, this was because household debris had been scattered due to the hurricane, but the locals took that and ran with it and then added toilet seats along the whole channel and there's now decorated toilet seats all along this little channel. Initially called Flagler's Folly, he decided to continue his railroad across the Keys connecting them to the mainland. Construction of this overseas railroad would require engineering innovations as well as a vast amount of labor and money. Once the decision was made to move forward with the project, Flagler sent his engineer, William J. Crome, to survey potential routes for the railroad. 
They initially favored a route extending the railroad from Homestead southwest through the Everglades to Cape Sable, where it would then cross 25 miles of open water to Big Pine Key and then continue on to Key West. However, it was quickly determined that it was more feasible to run the railroad south to Key Largo and then just follow the islands of the Florida Keys. Plantation Key, along with four other keys, make up the Isla Morada area or city here in the Keys. We are flying over that area now. At one time during construction, 4,000 men were employed and the project cost more than $50 million. Despite the hardships, the final link of the Florida East Coast Railway to Trumbo Point in Key West was completed in 1912. And that year, Henry Flagler rode his first train into Key West aboard his private rail car. This marked the completion of the railroad's connection to Key West, linking by railroad the entire east coast of Florida. It was widely referred to at the time as the eighth wonder of the world. Much of the overseas railroad in the Middle Keys was heavily damaged or destroyed in a Labor Day hurricane in 1935, which was a Category 5 hurricane. After the hurricane, the Florida East Coast Railway was financially unable to rebuild the damaged section of the uh, Overseas Railroad, so the state purchased the railroad's entire right-of-way and the remaining infrastructure for a price of $640,000. This right-of-way and infrastructure would be used in the ongoing project to build the Overseas Highway. The highway, which originally consisted of two portions, then known as State Road 4A, went through the upper and lower part of the Keys, but it used a ferry to connect the 41-mile gap between them. Now with these existing rail lines and bridges, those could be utilized by converting them for automobiles. The Florida Keys Overseas Highway is a 113 mile long road, starting at the Miami-Dade-Monroe County line and ending in Key West, and is part of the U.S. Route 1. U.S. Route 1 stretches 2,400 miles, from the America's First Mile sign in Fort Kent, Maine, to mile marker zero at the tip of the Florida Keys. During the 1980s, many of the original bridges were replaced, many of the old concrete bridges were left, and they remain in use as fishing piers and pedestrian paths today. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Key West came into its own as an easygoing destination for free spirits who wanted to live by their own rules. The musician Jimmy Buffett arrived in 1971, and the island has been associated with his style of music, especially his famous song, Margaritaville. By the 1970s, many of the prevalent industries in Key West, such as shrimping, which lost its market share to pond-raised shrimp, and cigar making that lost most of that business to the industrialization and rolling machines of the cigar industry in Tampa, Florida, this all led to an economic downturn in the Keys. This would be Fiesta Key, which connects to Long Key. Another industry at the time, which was less discussed during the 1970s, was the large amount of marijuana that was being smuggled into the United States through Key West. Because the town is located only 90 miles from Cuba, drugs would flow from Colombia to Cuba and then on into Key West. Although many industries had come and gone in Key West, the military was the real lifeblood of the economy since World War II, especially following the Cuban Missile Crisis. Compounding the fallout from the collapse of the shrimping and cigar industries was the military base closings that started in the late 1960s. The resources from locations like this were being diverted to the war effort in Vietnam. The Navy, leaving Key West, took about 25,000 military and civilian personnel out of the economy, as well as all of the military spending. We are now passing by the Florida Keys Marathon International Airport. Key West downtown essentially became a ghost town with very few businesses surviving this. This led Key West to put its efforts into building the tourism industry. Tourism previously was a pretty small part of the economy and had been mostly people from southern Florida. This was bad timing since the 1970s brought about the oil embargo and people were not willing to travel all the way to Key West not knowing if they were going to get gas to drive back to the mainland. We are at the start of what is known as the Seven Mile Bridge. But slowly tourism did pick up and things were looking up by the end of the 1970s. 
In the 1980s, two events would work against the growing tourism industry in Key West. In 1980, the Mariel boat lift occurred. On April 20th, 1980, the Castro regime in Cuba made a surprising announcement that it would allow all Cubans who wished to leave the communist country to board boats at the Port of Mariel in Havana and flee to the United States. This brought a large number of Cuban refugees to Key West. By the time it was over, close to 125,000 refugees had reached the U.S. The problem was that the news coverage of this event, uh, the news reports had people believe that Key West was overrun by refugees and crime was rampant, even though this was not really the case. The second event was in 1982. The United States Border Patrol set up a roadblock and an inspection point on U.S. Route 1 in front of the Last Chance Saloon just south of Florida City. Vehicles leaving the Keys were stopped and searched for narcotics and the occupants had to prove they were U.S. citizens. The Key West City Council complained repeatedly about the inconvenience for travelers to and from Key West, claiming that it hurt the Keys' important tourism industry. At times it would take four hours to get through the checkpoint. And obviously very few, if any, drug smugglers were caught who waits in line for four hours to get arrested. On April 22nd, a small group, including Mayor Dennis Wardlow and local attorney and pilot David Paul Haran, flew to Miami to attempt to get an injunction against the roadblock. When Miami's U.S. District Judge C. Clyde Atkins failed to issue the injunction, he left the citizens of Key West with little recourse. Tomorrow at noon, the Florida Keys will secede from the Union, Wardlow announced to the reporters gathered on the courthouse steps on his way out of the building. He and his associates headed home to prepare for war. The first act of rebellion occurred before they even returned to Key West. Moran, who was also the pilot, buzzed the roadblock on their flight back to the city. Mayor Dennis Wardlow and the city council declared Key West independence on April 23, 1982. In the eyes of the council, since the U.S. federal government had set up the equivalent of a border station as if they were a foreign nation, they might as well become one. We're passing over Summerland Key, and there is an airport here. Since many of the locals were referred to as conks, a term they believe came about from the large Bahamian population, the nation took its name as the Conk Republic. As part of the protest, Mayor Wardlow was proclaimed the Prime Minister of the Republic, which immediately declared war against the United States. They raised the blue and yellow flag of the new Conk Republic, symbolically breaking a loaf of stale Cuban bread over the head of a man dressed in a U.S. Navy uniform. Citizens of the New Republic then began throwing stale bread and conch fritters at federal agents, Navy sailors, and Coast Guard personnel that had gathered in attendance. About a minute after declaring war and firing the first verbal shot at the U.S., Wardlow then surrendered to a nearby naval officer and requested $1 billion in foreign aid from the United States to compensate for the long federal siege. The secession, described by some as tongue-in-cheek, and the events surrounding it generated national publicity for the Keys' plight. The roadblock and the inspection station were removed soon afterward, and it resulted in the creation of a new marketing strategy for tourism in the Keys. The Conk Republic celebrates its Independence Day every April 23rd as part of a week-long festival. To our left is the Naval Air Station, uh, where they do air-to-air -air combat training. I guess this is where we should fill out our forms to get a visa to visit the Conk Republic because we will be landing soon at the Key West International Airport. Now would also be a great time for you to hit the subscribe button. It really helps out the channel and I appreciate it. While you fill out your visa forms, I will get the plane on the ground. We will take a look around the Key West Airport. I believe we will find a Conk Republic flag there. say the inspection for drugs and illegal aliens at the Monroe County border is only one of many ways in which the southernmost part of the state's been singled out as a foreign nation. So at noon today, they made it official. Former Mayor Dennis Wardlow redubbed himself Prime Minister, announced Key West's secession from the Union, rechristening it the Conk Republic. 
Cheers went up as the new flag was flown. If Key West is a foreign country to Washington, Washington shall represent a foreign nation to Key West. Businessmen say the traffic jam-ups caused by the checkpoint kept away a lot of tourists. So the more enterprising among them made up for that by capitalizing on the revolution, selling conch visas, flags, and other memorabilia. Welcome to Key West. We are on the ground at Key West International Airport. It has the airport code KEYW. The airport sits here on 334 acres and it has one runway that is 5,076 feet long. Let's get the plane parked and shut down. We'll take a look around this beautiful area. We may have to pass through customs here in the Conch Republic. Maybe we can get ourselves some stale Cuban bread. One of the souvenirs sold in Key West is the Conch Republic passport. And there are actually stories that people have successfully used that passport to pass through actual customs checkpoints. I'm not sure if that's true, but that is funny if it is. <laughs> <laughs> 